Nature presents a lot of complicated challenges for the creatures that live in it. Some animals opt for incredible speed or amazing flight to escape their predators and survive. Others, ingenious camouflage or stunning mimicry to disappear into the background and avoid conflict. And others still use chemical warfare to keep their enemies at bay. Today, we're going to be exploring some of the most poisonous creatures that might turn up in your backyard. From an invasive worm armed with one of nature's most potent toxins to an arthropod that sprays literal cyanide, the world of these poisonous creatures is absolutely insane. And the worst of them not only possesses enough poison to kill a fully grown human, but is absolutely decimating ecosystems in parts of the US and Australia. This first one might be one of the most uncomfortable meals you'll ever eat. Turns out a lot of beetles are poisonous. Even ladybugs, or whatever you call them at home, are actually armed with mild toxins that make them taste terrible. Now, I'm not expecting that you're going out and eating them, but for lizards, birds, and small mammals that might see these tiny little beetles and think they make a good snack, that chemical defense not only might save that individual beetle's life, but predators remember when they eat something that tastes terrible and anything that looks like it, they'll probably avoid in the future. One of the reasons that ladybugs have such bright coloration is to warn predators that they're potentially poisonous. But the world of poisonous beetles doesn't stop there. Lightning bugs are poisonous as both adults and larvae. The chemicals they use to light up the night are not only capable of producing that incredible flashing reaction, but they also taste terrible. As a bonus, their larvae are not only poisonous, but also venomous. They're using a paralyzing toxin to subdue the soft-bodied invertebrates that they hunt in the leaf litter environment they call home. But none of these beetles compare to the blister beetle. These beetles are a serious problem, especially in areas that are raising livestock because they're herbivores and they live in the grass that grazing animals are eating. For many species of livestock animal, blister beetles are fatal if consumed. For you or me, if we ate them, it probably would give us a really bad upset stomach and wreak havoc on our digestive system. But we don't even have to eat these beetles to feel their toxic effects. Their poison is in their blood, and it turns out that it can be absorbed just through your skin. When threatened, these beetles do what's called reflexive bleeding. They'll actually intentionally, voluntarily bleed out of gaps in their exoskeleton, getting that toxic blood all over the skin of their attacker, and it causes massive, painful, burning blisters. As a result, many blister beetles have also evolved a bright, vibrant coloration. That blood is a useful weapon, but it's still necessary for their survival, and they'd rather keep it inside their bodies, if at all possible. Not all poisons are painful, though. Some of them are silent killers, and that is exactly the case with this horrifying creature. And I mean horrifying. Unless you live in Asia, the hammerhead worm is likely an invasive species, and it's going to be wreaking havoc on the ecosystem of your garden. The hammerhead worm is a species of flatworm, which we normally think of living in the ocean. But some of them have actually evolved to live on land. And when you are a slow-moving, soft-bodied invertebrate, you need to have defenses to make sure that things aren't just turning you into an easy meal. And that is where the toxic secret of the hammerhead worm comes in. They leave behind this trail of sticky, almost iridescent slime. But unlike an earthworm or a slug, it's not just sticky and gross. It's actually the key to their survival and the reason why hardly anything in their invasive range can eat them. The hammerhead worm is one of the only terrestrial invertebrates in the world that is known to produce a chemical called tetrodotoxin. If that name sounds familiar, it's because it's the same exact poison that kills you when you eat puffer fish that's prepared incorrectly. This is one of the most potent neurotoxins in the animal kingdom. Once it enters your body, it basically interferes with your nerve's ability to send signals, leading to things like paralysis and death. Now, one hammerhead worm probably doesn't have enough poison to kill an adult human, but for small mammals, small invertebrates, small reptiles that might try and eat them in the environment, it absolutely is enough poison to kill them. And because pretty much all of our nervous systems work about the same, if it paralyzes us, it definitely paralyzes those smaller creatures. The biggest reason these guys are a problem is they are hunting other invertebrates that are important for things like soil health. Earthworms might not be native to the US, but they are still a very vital part of maintaining healthy soil chemistry. And earthworms happen to be one of the favorite foods of the hammerhead worm. They tend to pretty much stick to soft-bodied invertebrates. So your pollinators, your pest control insects, they're not gonna be too affected 
by the presence of hammerhead worms, but if you start to see your garden having issues with like acidic soil or something, you might want to look for this odd looking creature. One of the more helpful creatures in your garden that you probably didn't realize might be poisonous is actually butterflies. Many butterflies are toxic. Most commonly and probably most iconic is the monarch butterfly. That orange and black coloration isn't just pretty for our eyes, it's actually a warning to birds and mammals that might try to eat them that they taste absolutely terrible. Now the nice thing with butterflies is none of them seem to be necessarily lethal if consumed. I suppose a very small bird might get sick enough from eating a monarch butterfly that it could die, but a bird that's small enough for that to happen probably isn't eating monarch butterflies, so it's probably a non-issue. But it's not just the monarch butterfly that's poisonous. Things like the pipe vine swallowtail uses the same exact strategy, and even some moths, like the cinnabar moth. Most of these are day-flying lepidopterans who are going to have lots of visual predators, birds, mammals, potentially even some insects that would see them as food. But using that bright coloration, they warn predators that, hey, I taste terrible, eat something else. And over time, various populations of insectivorous predators have learned to leave them alone. The way they actually get their poison is super neat. It's similar to how poison dart frogs get their poison. It's not something they just produce in a gland like other poisonous creatures. They actually get it from their diet. Monarch caterpillars feed on things like milkweed, which are highly toxic to most other insects. But not only are they immune to the milkweed's toxins, they actually sequester them into their own bodies and incorporate them so that if something tries to eat them, they're gonna taste really, really terrible. While pipe vine swallowtails and cinnabar moths feed on different types of host plants, it's all the same principle. They take different alkaloid chemicals from the plants they're eating and sequester them and concentrate them into their own cells, making them a very unpalatable meal. In the tropics, poison dart frogs are doing the same thing. They're taking chemicals from the mites and ants they eat on the forest floor and turning them into potent neurotoxins they secrete in their slime. But in captivity, fed a different diet, they're not toxic at all. While it is more difficult to keep these caterpillars alive on host plants they're not used to eating, if you feed a monarch caterpillar non-toxic plants, that individual is not going to taste terrible like the rest of the monarch butterflies. You've probably heard the phrase, you are what you eat. Well, the monarch butterfly is a great example in nature of an animal doing exactly that. One of my absolute favorite groups of poisonous creatures are the flat millipedes. Many of these large, stocky millipede species with bright speckling down their backs are actually poisonous, and the toxin they use is hydrogen cyanide. It's one of the most popular poisons from things like spy movies, but it actually does exist in real life. The first thing you'll notice when you actually pick up one of these millipedes is that they immediately smell strongly of almonds. It's not a myth that almonds have cyanide in them, and that almond smell is the same smell that cyanide carries. They release this gas as a form of defense against predators. And for you or me, it isn't really enough to affect us, but for a small fox or raccoon that sees them at night and thinks they're a good snack, probably not a great time. Cyanide is a very interesting poison because it doesn't act like your typical cytotoxins or neurotoxins that we talk about a lot here on the channel. It actually targets the mitochondria in your cell. And if you remember high school biology, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Mitochondria produce all of the energy in your body. In the same way that you need nerve signals signaling to function, you also need ATP production to survive. It's a core piece of cellular respiration. You can't move your muscles, your heart can't beat, your brain can't fire signals. Anything that uses energy in your body cannot function if ATP is not being produced, and cyanide blocks the production of ATP. So rather than it just shutting down your nervous system, it effectively shuts down every cell it comes in contact with. It's a very, very potent toxin. The nice thing is these millipedes have evolved a brilliant warning to tell us to leave them alone. Most of them have bright, striking yellows or pinks on a jet black carapace. That aposomatic warning keeps visual-based predators away, and that pungent smell when you approach usually is the last line of defense. This doesn't have anything to do with their poison, but one of my favorite things about them is that nearly all of them are fluorescent under UV light. So if you have a little UV flashlight, you can actually go out at night and find these crazy millipedes that you might not have even realized are living in your area. They're slow moving detrivores, feeding on decaying material in the forest floor, in the leaf litter, and in that top layer of soil. So even though they do have these really potent chemicals and they are poisonous, they're actually a really vital part of the natural cleanup crew in the ecosystems we live in. This last one will probably come as a huge surprise to you, and that is that toads are poisonous. 
Yes, even the basic little toads that you see in your backyard every summer, they're poisonous. And the secret is in those big growths right behind their eyes. All toads are frogs, not all frogs are toads. And to identify that you're looking at a toad and not a generic frog is these big bulbous things called paratoid glands right behind their eyes. And it's right there in the name, it's a gland. And inside that gland is poison. Most toads are more or less harmless. The poison just tastes bad and will make you sick if you try to eat it. But in certain parts of the US, there are toads that are quite toxic. In the Southwest, we have the Sonoran Desert Toad, which is one of the most poisonous native amphibians in the United States, and their poison is so toxic that it can cause powerful hallucinations. But even more dangerous in the southeast is an invasive species, a species that is also destroying environments in parts of Australia, the cane toad. Native to South and Central America, these toads get massive. And not only are they huge, but their poison packs a real punch too. The cane toad possesses what's known as bufotoxin. And while typically it's just a mild irritant, if it gets on your skin, if you ingest it, it can be really dangerous. I couldn't find a ton of information on the exact mechanism of bufotoxin, but the symptoms that it causes tells me it's probably a neurotoxin. On the low end, it can cause things like hallucination or flu-like symptoms, but it can also lead to paralysis, loss of consciousness, and even heart failure. When I was reading through the list of symptoms that bufotoxin elicits in humans, honestly, it acts a lot like the venoms of certain elapid snakes, like taipans. There is a really good reason why almost nothing eats them in their invasive range. And that's a big problem. It's a big toad, and these predatory amphibians basically will eat anything that fits in their mouth. Other frogs, other toads, small mammals, many of the native insects, even small reptiles are on the menu. The problem with the diverse diet of the cane toad is that all of the things it's eating are necessary parts of the diets of other native predators. And when you introduce a prolific invasive predator like the cane toad into an environment, it disrupts all the native species. In habitats that have invasive species really take root and get established, we see biodiversity decline significantly. Across the world, the cane toad is considered to be one of the most destructive invasive species of them all. The cane toad's most potent chemical defense is also its most dangerous weapon and its conquest of habitats across the world. But most of the time, these poisons are just that, a defense that helps these creatures to survive in the environments they call home. The cane toad comes from a really tropical part of the world. High biodiversity means lots of competition and pressure to be extremely toxic in order to survive. But it's not just poisons that have helped animals to survive in extremely competitive habitats. One of my favorite chemical defenses is venom. And while normally we think of all kinds of crazy dangerous spiders like Sydney funnel webs, six-eyed sand spiders, and Brazilian wandering spiders when we think of venom, but there are actually a lot of spiders that have poorly understood venoms that might be more toxic than we think. And many of those are living in these very same rainforests. If you want to learn about a few rainforest spiders that might have some pretty gnarly venom, check out this video right here. Hope to see you there, but until next time, don't forget to get outside and find your own adventure.